we are honored to introduce our three guest speakers to discuss the theme of body image in the digital media society. And what does it tell about feminism? Kira Pendergast comes from Australia. She is the CEO of Safe on Social Media with 30 years of experience in IT business consulting, cybersecurity, and cyber safety. She works on educating people and organizations about how to use social media safely. She is a regular media commentator on the topic of cyber safety, social media risk management, and the law. Fabrizio Gallo comes from Italy. He is the founder of New Wellness Education and a trainer on the official list of the Italian National Agency. Since 2015, Fabrizio has been organizing projects on the impact of social media and technologies. With more than 50 international projects in eight different countries, Fabrizio gained experience in coaching, project management, well-being, personal development, and body awareness. Sandra Mikhail comes from Switzerland. She is an internationally known accredited practicing dietitian and the founder and director of Nutrition A to Z by Sandra Mikhail. Sandra's main areas of specialty are digestive disease, sports nutrition, eating disorders, and corporate health, working with local and multinational brands. She is also a mental health advocate. And here is the host of the Momentum Digital Saloon, Katie Gallus. She comes from Germany. Katie is a journalist and a storyteller with a massive crush on all things digital. Katie had worked for German public broadcasters Deutsche Welle, SWR, ARD, and ZDF. Hey friends, welcome again to our digital saloon Momentum in its newest edition. It's great to have you all back on board as we are always trying to debate contemporary topics concerning women, concerning IT, culture and digitalization. And of course, over the very high scale special guests and experts and of course with you in social media. So thanks for joining us. Again, the Momentum series of the LEAD initiative aims to introduce our partner organizations and to give important conversations which need to be discussed with enough space and time. My name is Katie Gallas. I'm an international journalist and I'm very happy to be part of Momentum and the Digital Saloon series. We want to hear more about challenges in our speakers' activism. We'd like to understand more where to help to develop a better understanding of these challenges and as well how to foster the dialogue that can lead to recommendations. Our topic of today, the body image in the digital media society, what does it tell us about feminism? How is the female body image represented in the digital media society and how can we link feminism and women's body image in social media? What impact does social media have on female self-image and what should we do about it? Our guests of today are Kira Pendergast, joining us from Australia. She's the CEO of Safe on Social Media with 30 years of experience when it comes to IT business consulting, cybersecurity and cyber safety. And her purpose is to educate people and organizations about how to use social media safely and in a conscious way. We also have Sandra Mikhail from us, joining us from Switzerland. She's the founder and director of Nutrition A to Z by Sandra Mikhail, and she holds a Bachelor of Nutrition and Dietetics and a Master of Advanced Studies in Nutrition and Health. And her main areas of speciality are digestive disease, sports nutrition, and eating disorders. And last but not least, we also have Fabrizio Gallo with us in our talk show. We have uh, the founder and the trainer of the New Wellness Education, and he's also the trainer in the official list of the Italian National Agency. Uh, he has worked and facilitated workshops and organized workshops in more than 50 international projects in eight different countries. It's great to have you on board. That's the spoiler. Body image is a multifaceted and complex construct due to its rather convoluted psychological definitions. Social media has played a part in influencing women's body images, playing a major role in redefining beauty standards for females and affecting the feminist social movement, which is being reconfigured with media, especially digital media. With an estimated 3.6 billion users worldwide, social media has become an indispensable part of our social life. With its help, the voice from the side of the female is more likely to spread. However, media is widely used for redefining and remodeling the beauty standards of femininity. Studies show that 88% of women compare themselves to images they observe on social media, 
with over half of them emphasizing that the comparison is unfavorable. This is why, in the eighth edition of the Momentum Digital Saloon, we are giving the floor to our high-level guests to tell their stories and to understand together the different aspects of body image in the digital media society and what it tells about feminism. We go on with our um, Q&A. So I'd like to dive in um, because the image of the female body in social media, it, maybe we should break it down because, of course, we all have our pictures and our definitions about it. But the question is really, and Santa, I'd like to start with you here. What is the female body image in the media, especially when it comes to achieving these whatever we call beauty standards, you know? Uh, so what, what I mean, is... What is the, can you answer, is it even possible to answer? I was going to say, no, there is really no straightforward answer because if you have to think about it, these ideals have been changing through centuries, like looking at where, you know, where it all started to where we are now. And I think with all these ideals, the, the common denominator is that they're unattainable and unachievable and they're constantly changing. And I think if we do want to continue to, the so-called pursuit of a, a beauty ideal, um, the likelihood of, uh, let's say, the younger generation trying to engage in a lot of these risky behaviors or even dieting and so on is, is hugely amplified. So for me, as a clinical dietitian working in this space, this, you know, at what point do we end this so-called beauty ideal? If we do want to link that to feminism, we do know that we don't want to conform to societal norms. So why are we looking at society setting what an ideal body should look like? We are not educated when it comes to that anyway, when it comes to the schooling system. So, so, so you know, as I said, it's really not a straightforward answer. There's so many answers to that. But I feel like we need to start educating the younger generation about the so-called ideal and the harms that come with it. We're diving into that of the recommendations and the possibilities and the to-dos in a moment. Kira, what is your what would what be your answer to the question when I ask you about the, the so-called female body image in the social media, especially? Um, when it comes to the pressure of achieving what we call these beauty standards? Yeah, look, it's a very big question that I've got two, two sides to. One, I see the impact every single day and I wouldn't, like the platforms, it's hard to hold them accountable because of laws in the US, Section 230C, the Good Samaritans provision of the, you know, one of the big communications decency acts in the US makes them as liable as the paper that a newspaper is actually printed on. So we can't hold them accountable, but we can start to educate young people not necessarily to believe influencers that are being paid a lot of money by the fashion industry to do this. Like I'm a 52 year old woman. As a teenager, my grandmother subscribed me to a magazine here in Australia called Dolly magazine that was thrown in my general direction. Once a month, I saw Elle McPherson and, and like international supermodels on the front cover. I didn't compare myself to them 24-7. But the flip side of all that, as, you know, someone who started what is one of the largest social media education companies in, in the world now, social media and cyber safety, but... I started that off the back of being relentlessly bullied about my size. I was 53 kilos heavier at the time and bullied daily by a woman in her 50s, fat shamed daily and changed my whole life because of that, had weight loss surgery, the whole thing. So I've got two very different perspectives on that big question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow, thank you also for sharing your story. We're coming back to you, of course, also in a minute. Uh, Fabrizio, um, what are your observations? You, of course, from your perspective, um, what is, or do we talk, should we talk in a different way about the female body image on social media? Or is that, is it a wrong discussion that you are actually observing within the field when it comes to body shaming, when it comes to the female body within the social media business? Two things that I like like to consider. One is connecting also what uh, with what uh, Kier said about the timing 
being bombarded by 24 7 by uh, promotions by commercial that it's with a specific purpose to sell so this is something that uh, it's really important to be aware of to raise awareness to work in education on in the way that uh, uh, to create kind of a shield that uh, protect uh, like the mental uh, health of people from this information that it's arriving to us also if we don't want because uh, um, be aware that it's a private companies that follow their own uh, uh, strategy to sell more but this is affecting the mental health of people uh, so this is first thing that they would like to to talk about and connect and the second it's about uh, um, what um, what they work with it's uh, the language that is used to to describe uh, the the content uh, what mentioned also before by, by Sandra about the the beauty the standard uh, this is a topic that go back to centuries uh, this is uh, there are philosophies that there are standards there are uh, what is uh, aesthetic uh, this is one thing the other side is uh, what is healthy I I work with yes uh, mm, of what can be healthy and uh, what is uh, uh, that people can do a part of uh, the um, image what can can do in order to to feel better in a healthy way because at the end what is relevant is to create a uh, strong self-esteem in this way there is no running behind uh, uh, what they call a fake image of uh, being uh, healthy and good and that it's coming from my point of view also uh, about this lack of self-esteem and lack of informations that mm. are inter uh, really interconnected but when we talk about um, the body image, what has changed? I mean, is it really the change that we are now all having this device here in our hands and that it's accessible all the time? Because the, the female body image was always in discussion and debate and it was also always and for a very long time on display in a way. So what has changed that we are now suffering um, and that we are obviously debating about this topic more than ever before, maybe? Kira? Um, well, you know, I've seen dramatic change over my my life, um, as I said before, from magazines to social media. And I think if I had social media as a young woman, I would have been a lot more confident in my body because I would have seen a lot more people with the same body shape as me, where magazines, you didn't have that. It was like I was the waif Kate Moss kind of era and a little bit before that where now you can seek out and find people that are the same shape as you and follow a, like influences that are body positive from that perspective as well and that was you know that's a there's a positive glimmer there that you can find that that was never never there when I was a teenager I think that's the big big difference for me. Sandra, what do you I, think? I was going to say, I completely agree with Kira. It's, it, it is a double-edged sword as well, especially because because of the accessibility, because of, let's say, the BB connectivity, what social media does. You're able to see that, all right, I, you know, I have other people that look like me. I'm not, you know, there, there is no longer this sort of set ideal with, like, you know, the Kate Moss, the Elle McPherson, et cetera. They're, they're different bodies. So, but again, there is just so much focus on the aesthetic rather than the substance. And I feel this is where the conversation again is, is starting to change around, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say like, uh, it, it will tie up to, to this whole body image one, once again, because if you look at how things are changing, um, does it, re you know, does a specific body image relate to a specific position um, or a status? So I remember reading somewhere, you know, back in the day, a woman holding a Louis Vuitton bag says something about her. But nowadays we look at a woman, you know, wearing a wearable. What does that say about you? So even, you know, again, stepping away from the aesthetic, but still. But do you think we can manage to get away from the aesthetics? Because it's always no. something that is no. freak, that's freaking our mind, right? Even I don't when we think talk about can, the girl no. boss movement, I mean, exactly. then you have to dress in these pink power suits, you know, still wearing sneakers, for example. You know, that's mm -hmm. like another movement where it's really based on the aesthetics. So that's the question. How do we detach 
the aesthetics from that actually per, from the person and from the body image. Is that possible? Again, it, no, I'll, I'll tell you, I think it's also, again, it's really about changing the narrative, right? I think, again, it's just, why don't you set an ideal for yourself? What, you know, what do you, you know, what makes you feel confident? What makes you, um, I don't know, want to go day by day without that need for comparison? Um, this is where I feel, as I said, it, it, it's always going to be there, but it's looking at it from a different light. Um, as I said, I'm probably, I can go on and on about yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's say, absolutely interesting. I mean, the same thing when it comes to health, you know, again, I, I know Fabrizio was talking about healthy, but I even feel, I no longer as a dietitian use that term healthy because I feel like it needs to be defined by the person that this whole term healthy has been completely hijacked by, you know, I call them the wellness unicorn society on social media, because again, it's, you have to redefine what healthy means to you. Um, yeah. We don't go by BMI anymore. We don't go by, you know, even when it comes to food labeling. Do you go by body positivity? Absolutely not. Again, I know this is, again, <laughs> another controver you know, another controversial answer, but I believe that a good starting point would be body neutrality. Again, I want to detach these strong emotions from, you know, love and hate and coming from an angle of respect. And this is something that I feel is quite important to start teaching, let's say, even the younger generation when it comes to how they view their own bodies, is whatever you're doing a form of respect or disrespect towards your body? Rather than, you know, if, if you do want to lose weight, is that a form of respect or disrespect towards your body and your current circumstance? So I think even that little phrase that I get a lot of my clients to ask themselves just stops them in their tracks and gets them to reevaluate their actions too when it comes to, let's say, attaining an ideal. Fabrizio, when you listen to, to Sandra and, of course, to Kira, what is something that resonates with your work, you know, when we talk about different narratives also, not talking about healthy, not talking about bo body positivity? What resonates with you? Is that something that you also integrate in your work? So there are two things that I was uh, uh, reflecting now by listening. The first one is uh, connect to the first question, what's changed with the social media? And is uh, for me the speed, the speed of uh, uh, sharing of information, both in a supportive way, but also in a not supporting way. And uh, what the the fear of missing out that it's uh, people that want to keep posting. And this is also how this the that platform is built, how the platform are built in order being private companies that want to earn money. They keep changing in order to keep um, making people to share more and more in order to have more uh, interaction. And uh, so the speed is something that it's uh, uh, triggering me like, uh, and also to, um, that it's, I believe, not uh, um, connect with the, the way of uh, uh, living uh, um, life, for example, how it was in the past with the, the, the tempo for everything being much slower. So being uh, with more time to adapt to new information, to adapt, to use it and to understanding. So this is the first thing that I was thinking. The second one is about when uh, Sandra mentioned the word uh, respect. Um, I use a, a lot the um, the care. So to when I work with, uh, I, I organize, I do organize um, with the European Union projects, uh, um, these connection camps. So uh, days where people put the phone in a box and we work on the five senses, we work on uh, uh, communication, we work on being with people. And I always start with uh, um, the, the putting the care, the care, uh, being careful uh, with themselves and with the others uh, in order not to, uh, um, in order to be kill, careless, but it's a bit like a trigger, like in order to not to wear mask, not to be, uh, to allow people not to wear the mask uh, that they want, that they pretend to be, but to be the authentic them. It's really something really big, but it's uh, focusing on the care. So how to take care about themselves, how to take care about uh, the person in front and which concrete actions can be done, which concrete steps. And uh, I see, I see, for example, what I mentioned before, in the moment of putting the phone down in a box, uh, I see and I hear and I... You see panic, have... probably. And then... Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I see know. people <laughs> physically shaking. I, I had some participants going like uh, going back home after two days asking, okay, I cannot. I want the phone back. I go home. 
So this, the first time that happened, I was really scared. I was like, how come that this simple action of putting a piece of uh, metal glass and uh, like the fact to detach from in a box, it creating so strong physical reaction, not like uh, shaking. This was really, and, uh, but I, what coming back to also the good side, uh, social media's technologies are really powerful. So they can be um, dangerous, but they can be really useful. So to share uh, uh, this um, content, like also what we are doing now, to share uh, uh, different perspective, uh, to give information, to give uh, um, focus on these topics that are so relevant, it's the, the good part. So coming back to conclusion for this part, it's like, uh, for me, the most important thing is to create critical thinking in order that people are able to find out uh, their own informations and not to be trapped in the bubble. Because but Fabrizio, also, that's the question. You don't find or you don't get mm, the lesson of critical thinking in social media. So you have to step out of social media to learn critical thinking outside of social media. Or do you learn it on a TikTok video, how to do critical thinking, TikTok learning? How does it work, you know, for all the listeners and audience? Right. <laughs> that's the question, because we yeah. get so much information on social media and on YouTube and on these digital media platforms. So where do we get trained for critical thinking? Um, maybe, Kira, you can jump in here. Um, because I saw a big smile on your face. I probably yeah. I don't learn critical thinking on TikTok, right? Yeah, no, you don't. Um, it's something that I try and teach every single day. And I start that from like four and five year olds all the way through to start critically thinking about how they're using a device. Like as Fabrizio just said, you know, there's studies that show now that teenagers are so heavily addicted to using their devices that it's become a part of them and physically removing it is the same as cutting off a finger. So the same bodily type of reaction. And I think personally, I think parents need to really step in from a young age. They tend to hand it over to schools to make it a school problem and get school to fix it. When, you know, if I ask a room full of teenagers, like I did yesterday, who's in a group chat, the whole room put their hand up, who's checked messages at 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, the whole room puts their hand up because parents aren't putting boundaries in place. And then they're wondering why all of these issues are happening and the trauma that's starting and everything from like image-based or, you know, sexual image-based abuse, um, body shaming, all of the trauma that comes with young people, you know, male and female, um, from that could be really controlled if parents actually stepped up and started parenting better in this rather than giving them a device because everybody else has got one. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, when you look around in playgrounds, you sometimes see kids four years old, five years old playing videos on the device because then they are quiet. Um, so how yeah. how do we also have to change our parenting in order to not silence the kids by social media? Because that's, I guess, also something where we need to find a balance because this is actually something that uh, motivates us to, to use social media as, as an emotional trigger spot where I can find a peace place, wherever that means, or or not when I'm when I'm bullied. So, Kira, maybe you can join join or take us with you in into your courses. Um, what is crucial? I mean, when you teach four or five years old, what what do they yeah. learn about critical thinking? Is it is it about not touching the phone, not touching the device? How do you even start? I mean, it's like such a crucial phase of of becoming. Um, a human being right yeah and I think it's you know the what I teach is around not doing something just because everybody else is like that being an individual and how important that is because that's what makes us all unique and beautiful the differences in in all of us and teaching kids to understand that is one big area of critical thinking but you'd be surprised like I, it's I know it's not the same in, in European countries, you know, but in Australia, we have a shocking culture when it comes to tall poppy syndrome. And, you know, when I get 
children at the end of my sessions to even pay each other a compliment and to not say anything. I actually say not about their physical appearance, about why they're a good human or why they're a good friend to you. And they struggle. They don't know how to do it. They find it really, really awkward. They don't know how to accept a compliment and they don't even know how to say thank you for something like that. So we have to dial it right back to the basics because as Sandra was saying before, you know, this has been going on for generations and generations and generations, you know, that we've had paintings, the Renaissance era, you know, it's all defined body types forever. And we really need people to start to understand that they're more than a body. And we have to start that conversation as young as possible. And I think we've lost quite a few generations, but we're certainly in a position now to change it. And that's where it needs to start young. And it needs to start about being an individual and, and being kinder to other people as well, I think, are the two majors. Sandra, when it comes to um, also, of course, food and you as a specialist for nutrition, um, how how did that change when you look into your clients? You know, we've got the first uh, smartphone I got was published 2005. So we are almost 20 years into the smartphone era where we compare our bodies, where we take photos, photographs of our food, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, having all these avocado toast. Well, you know, you all know what I mean. So we're mm -hmm. taking photographs of our bodies in the mirrors, the selfies, plus the food. Um, do you think we have to reshape this whole awareness of what when I take a photograph of something and what I do with that and how do I post it? So the narrative of yeah. every user or do we have to just not take any photographs anymore? I mean, obviously it's not realistic not taking any photographs anymore, but I think again, it's just coming back to the narrative, but also what is real? I think when it comes to, to social media, what's really important is this is a perfectly curated platform, even when it comes to food photos and so on. Um, this huge trend is, I don't know if you're aware of like what I eat in a day or a day on a plate. I mean, as a dietitian, you do see a lot of dietitians do that, but there's an absolutely no way I'll be doing that because my needs are very different to XYZ's needs. And that's going to you know, create another platform of comparison. This again goes back to this whole, um, you know, the, the evolution of, of, of what healthy is and teaching kids what is healthy. And I, I love what Kira did, you know, it's like, stepping away from the aesthetic and and you know and, and really digging deep um kids are finding it very difficult to take compliments or even just to compliment each other on something that has nothing to do with their physical appearance and even when it comes to food that's the same thing when it comes to this whole term healthy i mean when my six-year-old asked me what mommy what does healthy mean or like in, in german gesund and i was like you know what Healthy means being happy in your mind, being happy in your heart, and being happy in your tummy. So that to me is just like you said, starting off within the household, even when it comes to, 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 to parenting, basically. This is where I believe the change is going to start happening. And then that will feed into all these other areas with how social media is being used with you know, teaching kids that this is not real. This is just a perfectly curated world that is, is just, it's, you know, it doesn't, you know, your food doesn't have to look that way. Your your body doesn't have to look this way from whatever you're seeing on social. But that's interesting because one thing, I guess, is teaching and parenting kids. But the other thing is maybe being a millennial or maybe being uh, from the generation of the boomers, you know, and finding themselves or yourself within this trap of constant comparison and then maybe in the middle of an eating disorder. So, Sandra, what do you actually tell your clients, you know, to get detached from these narratives that are so toxic to your body, to your food, because you lose the connection to food and you lose the connection to appetite? Do you know, one of actually the first necessities um, that probably causes the same reaction that Fabrizio mentioned is going on the only detox that I condone as a social media detox. And... 
this tends to be a necessity in the beginning that I get a lot or most of my clients, especially ones that are struggling with eating disorders off social media. Again, although I don't know if they're doing it or not, but 90, I would, I would say 90% of the time they are um, to bring them back to reality, not to let, not to get them lost in this whole world. It is a rabbit hole of, of information, a rabbit hole of, of again, these, these ideals of what I should be or shouldn't be eating. But the first thing that I get to do with a social media detox and the reactions that I would get, like physical reactions of tears. And, but I, you know, but, but, but what would people say if I'm not on there, if I'm not responding to these messages? But so, so from that perspective, it's really about educating them about how the algorithm works, for example, knowing, you know, who their followers are, knowing what hashtags to follow. All that also, you know, is, I'm not going to say it's a big part of my, 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 my role when it comes to education, but this is something that I do like to raise awareness on is, is how they should be using social media or how social media presents a lot of these images based on their searches, just yeah. to be aware of that. Sandra, how do you use your social media? Is it more a marketing platform or is I it... have a love-hate relationship with social media. After two burnouts, I've actually decided to, I mean, I delegate. So I do have people, you know, uh, part of my team who, who help me from that social media perspective. But I am very, very mindful as to one, how much time I do spend on social media because it's impact on my own mental health struggles that I've had in the past, especially when it came to anxiety. Um, and this whole concept of FOMO that I feel like this whole fear of missing out, um, that a lot of people, you know, again, you get into that, uh, rabbit hole of comparison or, or, oh, you know, or even when it comes to, to, to success, you're just looking at pe people post their successes on social media, or like their business successes. For me, I'm probably the complete opposite. I've been actually posting on, let's say, failures and hardships and so on, just to bring a little bit of reality to a perfectly curated platform. So, yeah, I'm probably the wrong person, but I, I try to stay off social as much as I can. Thank you. But Fabrizio, thank you so much for sharing this with us, Sandra. Fabrizio, how do you use social media as an expert and a very, you know, in this mindful game, of course, of having social media or not having social media, but also teaching others of being critical about social media and about the algorithm? How do you use it? I use it as a tool, as a tool to... Uh... First of all, I use it in different ways uh, according to the different social media. So, so I use it as a tool for work and I use it as a tool to support to reach what I want to reach. For example, I do cycle and I do um, kind of type of uh, ultra cycling races. And uh, I use it as a tool to promote that in order to work with the sponsor with a specific goal. So I decide, okay, uh, how do they uh, can support to reach my goals and that's it without uh, giving more this is my my strategy for myself but i'm not like that uh, teaching other people that uh, it's what i build that is working for me because uh, i also recognize i started to organize the this connection campaign to studies in, to study in this field because i was recognizing it was affecting my life a lot and was thinking how come that this is uh, shaping my own way of thinking so how can i understand more what is happening And uh, I recognize that for me, it's it's working to use it in this way. And uh, what I also, uh, coming back to the, the the project, the European projects that I do through Erasmus, what I bring in the is to um, use uh, uh, different approaches. What does it mean to use the five senses to uh, being the the um, the connection, the relation with uh, phone and social media, an addiction. This is working on the dopamine level and uh, increasing the, 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 the way that people is having dopamine only through the phone. So how to, through the social media and through the, the likes and the comments and the notification, this is uh, create for that. So how to lower that, uh, that is to, uh, by removing the phone, by removing the social media, To, to physically uh, show uh, by experience to the people that they can have these good feelings doing a lot of different things. So to differentiate, not to, mm. not to go only, only one thing because this is passing from one addiction to another one, but to do one day one thing, another day another thing, another day another thing, and also to work with 
sharing feelings with others, to recognizing feelings, to acknowledge it, but to do a repeated action because the behavior, uh, the, the pattern of using the phone is an action. So in order to change that, I believe it's important to do a different action and to repeat it. In this way, it's creating a, 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 new, a, new, um, a new behavior and in long term, this can, a long, long run. This is also an important it's thing. It's a marathon, right? It's not a exactly. It never, it's a never, never ending process yeah. because also with all the addictions, uh, this is really relevant with working with addiction, um, with all the addictions. It's not that one it, that you have a moment without, that's it. No, that mm -hmm. uh, every moment that the person feel again um, down, it's going back there. So it's understanding what is the need behind. It's need of a compliment. Talk with a person. It's need uh, of uh, new information. Mm, do something else. So in order to be able to educate people that they can do different actions, and this action are, uh, can be uh, giving them good feelings, good uh, uh, positive emotions, uh, also negative, but something different that they can experience and. Uh, that there are moments that it's okay, that, uh, okay, I want to, I do by myself to post a photo just to have some comments, but not that it becomes a normality to understand yeah, what is the causes, what is the need behind and uh, what can be done to, to, to work on that need as a different concrete action uh, in order not to to go back to to that one, to the previous one. But this this really, I mean, this fosters the emotional intelligence, right? To know a little bit more about your own emotions. Kira, how do you teach that young kids or or our kids in high school that they are detaching it from the visual and the aesthetics, but really understanding themselves a bit better? You know, what is the emotion that is triggering me in that regard? So how do you teach that to young boys and girls or even adults that are more mature maybe um, about emotional intelligence in that way. Yeah, look, it's very different because when you're talking with little ones now, like it's just life to them. There is no such thing as online and offline. It's all just one thing and it's us that need to catch up with that. Like I've seen and can give you an example of worst case scenario of that. And I can also tell you really good, good outcomes for kids like LGBTQ kids. I had a, a young girl at a high school that I, I worked in come up to me and say that she was gay and she couldn't, there was nobody else in the little town that she lived in that she could connect with. And she'd found her whole tribe effectively online and was using it as a tool to meet people but was asking my advice around who she should talk to when she should open up a conversation and I actually have showed her a video of me that I filmed like a screen record using an app that I changed myself from 52 to 15 to 5 to 20 in one minute and then at the end I ended up looking like a supermodel version of Liz Hurley. It was just extraordinary. So I showed her that just to make sure there was some safety there but to use it to connect with people and understand that she's not alone and foster what she was feeling from that emotional intelligence point of view and going in eyes wide open. But honestly the worst case scenario and this is this is hard to hear so trigger warning I had an 11 year old girl who was playing a little game called Roblox which is wildly popular with little kids and it would have to be the most dangerous game that I've ever encountered because a lot of people don't realize that the average age of a gamer is around 34 to 36 years old and they're all over Roblox and so it this little girl came up to me after a session and described that she'd been playing Roblox, that she'd been offered money, like free Robux, which is the in-game economy, to play the mum in a role-play game and went into this room where her little in-game character was, she described a full-blown sexual assault to me. And But the thing that she said that really got to me, Katie, was she said, this happened to me. It wasn't her character in the game, it was her. And so we need to understand that 
children have changed in a way. And this is where parents come in to foster all of the things we're talking about. Because if that little girl hadn't have spoken up, the trauma that she could carry from that kind of thing where to her it's just her, whether it's online or off, is something that we're not even really looking at yet. And parents have certainly checked out of, and that will dramatically change someone's emotional intelligence and things when they've been traumatized to a point that it's like, boom, what just happened? How do we deal with this? The principal looked at me and went, what is this? Is this a mandatory report? Like I'm sure you have similar, which is that something that has to be reported immediately to the police. And we decided to do that because of the trauma on this little girl. So we need to really think about, again, fostering strong, emotionally intelligent kids from a really young age, because I think you know, I'm a very old digital native only because I started in IT when I was 21. So I literally sold all of the, was part of the team that sold all of the equipment to the University of Technology in, in Sydney to connect Australia to the internet. Like we were way, way back then. We didn't have the internet when I started working in IT. So I think we've lost a few generations along the way and what we're thinking about everything to do with emotional intelligence and body image and stuff has been directly passed on to our kids i know my 26 year old son carries a lot of what i thought about myself and he did the same things and but we've got a chance like what sandra and fabrizio were both saying we've got it we've got a chance with younger a younger generation on changing the way that we talk about things, acknowledging that online and off is the same thing. It can be used as good and bad, but we have things like orthorexia appearing and all of this sort of stuff through the use of social media. And so getting them to fully understand what that is, not just someone coming in like I do and delivering an hour talk at a school and then walk them back out the door again. It's a long-term program that needs to happen over and over and over again. It can't be a one-off and then walk out because teachers haven't been trained in it or whatever. So one or workshop and done, this is not the solution, right? No. I think right. it needs to be part of the curriculum. Parents, I think we this need has to be, yeah. We need parents on board. And I, I definitely, just like Kira said, it's the continuity. I mean, even just my, you know, so some of my workshops on mental health and nutrition, these are just like little, you know, a one-off workshop that happens once every couple of years. But I just feel like if, if it's, you know, it, it needs to be part of the curriculum in schools, teaching about mental health, teaching about social media use, especially for dealing now with the, if we do have a chat to the younger generation, then we can already start now. But then also looking at how are we going to approach the parents? I mean, also, I mean, when you look at parents, parents are also constantly on their phones. 100%. So <laughs> it is, again, this is where the modeling comes in. So, and, and this is why I say it's, <laughs> it's, it's not, you know, I wish, I don't ever think that we're going to have a straightforward answer, but I do believe there is a chance that we can start now. Um, and it will be on, on very different levels. I'd like to be a little bit more political now here because, of course, we talk about um, body images and, you know, a lot of countries now, they call out this female, uh, feminist foreign policies and more feminism in different, in different fields. So what is your opinion on that? How dependent is social media from feminism and also feminism from social media when we'd like to achieve this consciousness? within social media when we'd like to achieve these emotional intelligent kids but also of course adults so how does feminism help us here Fabrizio one point from my point of view it's uh, the the level of how the governments are talking about uh, we were talking about the parents that it's uh, um, really really the key uh, how uh, they behave how the the child mirror them and so more about what they tell them about what they do what they do and uh, how they are mirrored by the children and how the the this is 
uh, shaping what uh, what the behavior. When we go on, on macro levels, I believe it's crucial how uh, um, who, the decision makers of the of the society how do they talk, how do they include the topic in the in the um, in the, in they're normalize it the topic in the in the the way of uh, uh, of communicating with people because if it stays on the, on on a level that it's uh, uh, bring only by activists bring only by uh, bottom up approach of it can uh, it can work it can have an impact but it will not reach uh, uh, the full potential the full majority of the people because still will be seen as something uh, apart. This is my point of view, like the policies, the decision makers, how uh, it, uh, and this, I see it in Europe uh, happening through uh, what is done by the European Commission with the, how they define how to give grants to specific type of projects, because this give uh, the institutional credibility that it's allowed to people who is not connect with the topic because the problem is that when uh, when there is a uh, it's like similar to social media there, there is a bubble it's who if you are inside that if you if it's part of your language if it's part of your culture uh, in inner culture of the the the, the group uh, for you the topic it's important if you are outside uh, and there is a part of the society who is ignoring it who is not uh, not even talking about it's also difficult because there is no critical thinking, there is no education, it's happening bottom up. Uh, so it's really relevant how the uh, decision makers bring, uh, uh, normalize uh, uh, the language, normalize the, the, the topic and make it not anymore as an activist working on that, but as a, as a part of the society that it's, uh, that it's uh, mm, normal. This is my my point of view. It's really uh, there is no need a, no need to talk because it's not a a, a, a specific topic. How to do it? Uh, well, <laughs> how to do it? I don't know specific. Um, Please let us know. We are all curious. We need your answers. <laughs> the point is uh, doing uh, advocacy, uh, gathering together, go doing good lobbying. Uh, uh, doing uh, um, giving but is it uh, lobbying for the politicians um, to raise the awareness on the political level or Fabrizio because we were also talking about regulation at the beginning is it also lobbying on also. the big private players because let's 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 face it we are dealing not just with social media they are all uh, privately owned corporates you know they'd like to make money with the data that they gain so how do we actually raise the awareness and not just raising the awareness, you know, for actually changing the situation that we're in right now. The, 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 how the government uh, uh, can influence and affect physically that is through regulations. So yes, uh, going in the direction of, uh, of every regulations, but that are understood by the people also, because that is the fact because if a regulation is there, but there is no understanding why the regulation is there, uh, from the other side, I don't know if it's bringing a positive or a, a, a negative effect on the people, because this is also the point of uh, uh, communication uh, of the importance. So the, the, the work of the job of who is doing advocacy is also what we are doing now. So talking about uh, uh, all the aspects and... Uh, but at the end, yes, I believe in to the fact that the, 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 the regulation... Uh, from my point of view, need to be applied because what are regulation at the end? It's uh, people who delegate to some experts to set up boundaries to protect themselves. Yeah. So this it's uh, like in theory regulation. Then if we go to all what is behind the interest that can that is also happening, the lobbying on the other side. But at the end, it's the in theory regulation. It's again I repeat it. Uh, uh, people who delegate their own power of decision to somebody who should be more expert that put some lines that protect them. 
So, but if this is not happening, of course, the question is really how do we achieve that? We see that in the climate movement, you know, Fridays for Future. So that really comes from the civil society. This big pressure on now the climate conferences. So would you agree or maybe would you, would you disagree that we need such a social movement towards the big media corporates, the, the, the big social media players, in order to get these regulations as fast as possible? Or... Do you see someone else in, in the responsibility? Kira, maybe. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because you come from a very practical field, you know the background behind the IT, um, but of course you also know the big players. You know that Be Real, the app is not real when we talk about <laughs> real photos, so, although it's called Be Real. But you know, how do we, how do we change that? Yeah, that's going to be extremely difficult and a topic of constant debate. Um, you know, without changing some laws in the US, we're not going to make any change at all. Like I, I live in a very young country compared to the rest of you. We've had one female prime minister who actually became very famous on TikTok for her misogyny speech. I don't know if you saw that, Julia. If it's worth a watch, Julia Gillard just ripping into Tony Abbott, who was also an ex-prime minister, about how misogynistic he was and things like that. So I think, you know, there's a couple of angles here. I we need to hold people accountable and the platforms accountable for letting people influence. Like we've just had a classic case with Andrew Tate, um, the you know, and the effect that that has had on young boys. I was challenged by a ten-year-old boy in a session a couple of days ago. There was 180 kids in the room, and a ten-year-old boy is like, "Why don't you like Andrew Tate, Miss?" And just kept asking me the question over and over and over again. And when I was trying to explain to him that feminism is equality, it's not men over women, which is this th constant threat that, you know, some men feel, obviously not Fabrizio, but some men, some men feel that. And we've got to be careful if we give people like Andrew Tate a platform, um, because like it, it just amplifies it like, boof. and so I think there needs to be a way that it's regulated to cut that down. I don't know how that's going to happen. We need to do this again. It all comes back to education from a really, mm -hmm. really young age. And, and you know, the next generation knowing that feminism is about equality and nothing else, really. And it's just then because each country in the world is very, very different when it comes to that. The religions are very, very different when it comes to that. So it's going to have to be like a cataclysmic shift for something to change there. But as long as we do what we can in our own backyard, and I'm I'm hardcore when I'm presenting and something happens like that, I pulled that 10-year-old out of the class. I made him sit on the stair and I made him wait until the end of the session. I had a teacher with me, obviously, but then I went through in very, very detailed ways of why what he said was completely wrong and referred to his sister and his mother and how would he feel about that, all of those things. And you can see he kind of got it at the end, but, you know, that's an extreme case. But we need to think about how we do this better from, from a younger age. And I think holding social media platforms accountable, changing some of the laws, actually making sure that when things are reported that something is actually done about it. Like, you know, we... In Australia, we have an e-safety commissioner and you report things there, but they get to choose what someone finds serious, harmful or humiliating. You know, the law is to menace, harass and cause offence. So who gets to tell me what I find offensive? You know, it's that's that's all the things that I think we need to change at a government level, that if someone finds something serious, harmful, offensive, any of those words, it's their choice. And when it's reported to an app because it has upset someone, that any government regulator should step in and back that someone, not go, oh, it's too hard. We'll just refer you off to another agency to have a chat to someone over the phone, which is what I see more often than not, being very political there. <laughs> <laughs> 
very political, which I'm known for. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid to speak my mind when it comes to, you know, I, I, I have kids all the time saying there's a video on TikTok fat shaming me from when I was in, you know, junior school and now I'm in high school. It's still there. What do there. you tell them? How do you help these kids? How do you help them to get over it or to not, you know, to let that sink too deep? It's hard to tell them to get over it, to be honest. You can't tell them to get over it. There has to be professional counselling and things involved. I'm not a counsellor. I have a tech background. I'm doing a counselling diploma only because I end up in these tiny little dots on the map that you would never hear of that don't get resources at all. And, you know, some tiny little towns that I've been in where there's been sexual assault or huge things that have happened through social media, they get don't get access to someone to counsel them for six months. So I end up in these sorts of locations, but I'm not a counsellor by any way, shape or form. So I have to refer it to a professional. So I can't answer that question because all I can do is give them good advice on where they can report it so they feel supported and they feel heard. And I think that's the biggest thing is people need to be heard, especially young women that are copying it online from every angle, whether it's seeing an influencer or some boys call them a fat cow or, you know, you've got a dimply body or your boobs aren't big enough or, or, you know, whatever, or they're being constantly compared or then they're being sent unsolicited pictures from from young men and things like that that are you know can be really traumatic for young girls as well you know there's all of those things so hearing them letting them know that there is support available you know that there is private organizations out there now that can get things taken down but sometimes they have to know the reality if they have to navigate this space themselves because mm. you know of course yeah otherwise it's too late. back up yeah Sandra, maybe you can give us also a glimpse of who is coming to you finding advice, you know, from you. Is this something that people are doing for prevention or are they already in this rabbit hole of comparison, eating disorders? You know, where is a good, a good point of starting this um, higher consciousness of what is social media doing to me? I mean, I get a mix of different people, so it's not just one one type of one type of person that comes to me where they've been influenced on social media. But um, I just wanted to say, I mean, I absolutely love what Kira just said. I'm just nodding here, where yep, 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 absolute. Like there's there's nothing I'd add to that. But let's say from from a from a clinical dietitian working in the space of eating disorders and just also seeing this whole rise of orthorexia, with which is this obsession um uh, obsession of let's say clean eating or healthy eating and so on so i can't do any of this alone so for me what's really important is being able to offer or building up the the, the team that my clients need because change or, or even recovery let's say has to happen on different levels so i will pull in um, we've got different therapists that we work in psychologists who are very very well experienced when it comes to that field um, relearning, you know, what, what health means to them. Again, just changing the narrative completely. Um, I do know that some of the therapists that we work with also help the younger kids navigate this whole world of social media, know how, you know, they are going to be exposed to it. You know, I can be here and say, oh, I know, get off social media. You need to go on a social media detox. But that, that's not going to be realistic. And that's not going to be, you know, that's not a very beneficial, let's say, maybe in the short run, yes, just during that initial period. But I think giving people the tools and the skills to be able to navigate this world, to be able to navigate and, and start to define like, what does healthy mean to me when it comes to my strength, when it comes to my mind, when it comes to my food. This is where I believe, you know, I come in. So again, nutrition is at the core of it all. Um, but 
Yeah, as I, I don't, I don't think there's a straightforward answer to to, to your question. I well, think but it is a different different question. <laughs> I know, but thank you so much. You talked about navigation, and as a geographer, as a study geographer, you got my heart already. <laughs> because I think it's so much about finding your own navigation, and of course, yeah. you need the tools, and of course, you need help. Don't say I'm opening Google Maps for that, but you know, yeah. finding the right people and the right tribe, of course, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, to get answers to very personal questions because of course it all comes down to a personal life. Wow, what a topic and what a talk. Thank you so much, Kira Pendergast, for joining us late at night in Australia. Thank you, <laughs> Sandra sure. Mikhail and Fabrizio Gallo. Thank you so much for joining us. And to all our listeners, to all our audience, uh, yeah, we are so keen and thrilled to hear more from your experiences. What are your thoughts now? What echoes in your mind when you we're listening to our conversation. We are so thrilled and excited to hear more from you. Leave us some comments and I hope to see you soon again for the next Digital Saloon. All the best for you. Bye. Hi, I'm Nusa Ayari, CEO of the LEAD Initiative. And I'm Jörg Schäfer, founder and CEO Europe. Together, we thank you for watching the saloon. I want to ask you to check out our YouTube channel and our website. Stay tuned and do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank <laughs> you.